Thank you so much, Reverend McKinstry. Um, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, good evening, Zoom family. Good evening, phone family. It is a great pleasure to be here with you tonight to share again in another expectation moment. We're coming up on 200 days. So somebody write that down. 200 days, I think, is going to be be um, uh, Thursday. So we're almost at 200 straight days of expectation moment. And we're again grateful that God has spoken to us every night through myself and all other ministers. We've gotten a, a ream of word each night as God has shared through us so that we may be encouraged during this season. Um, late, late, the last three series we worked on, the first one was in, in regards to seeking the Lord. Then we talked about walking with the Lord. Uh, then we recognized there's a great promises of God. And then now we talked about the provisions of God. But even as I started the, 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 the series on the, the provisions of God, I began to recognize that in the Old Testament, actually all through the Bible, there are names for God. And the reason why is not that God needs many names. It's just so that his people will understand his attributes in all that we do. God wants us to understand his attributes. He wants us to understand not just who he's called, but he wants us to know his name, but also he wants us to know what he is capable of doing. And especially in a time like this, in the life of the world in which we live with all of the challenges that many of us face, it is important to know who God is. If you need healing, you need to know God's a healer. If we need the same, we need to know God is a sustainer. We need to know these things, and we need to know that God has a track record, so to speak, of how he does and how he treats those who we trust in him. And so tonight we're going to embark upon another trail. And looking at uh, the Lord as as our is, is, is the Lord in His presence, it's called Jehovah Shammah. So if somebody can jot that down, Jehovah Shammah. And our text for the day is found in the Book of Ezekiel, chapter forty-eight. We talked about Jehovah Jireh on the last three days, and God is our provider. But now we're going to talk about God and His presence in our midst. In the Book of Ezekiel, as you turn to the Book of Ezekiel, we recognize that this is one of the major prophets, and I always like to take the time to. Expressed that none of the prophets of mine is just the amount of volume of the work in which they prophesied. We understand <clears throat> that Ezekiel, his whole prophetic ministry took place while he was in Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel got his call um, to to be a prophet uh, when he was 30 years old. And he was already in Babylonian captivity, had been there for five years. And so while he was in Babylon, while he was in Babylon, Babylonian captivity, God called him to prophesy, and God called him to specifically prophesied to the people of the people uh, who were in captivity in regards to their return from captivity. In other words, Ezekiel's message was tough because he talked about the judgment of God. In other words, what he told people was, listen, you're in the situation you're in now because of what you've done. And then he moved on to tell the other nations, you're going to be judged as well because of what you're doing. But the last part of Ezekiel, he gives a good, good message. And I, I love to say this all the time. Whenever we read the word of God, we recognize that even out of, out of God's justice may come condemnation. Out of God's mercy and grace comes words of confidence. So in the last chapter, chapter 48 of Ezekiel, we see the crowning moment of Ezekiel's prophetic message to the people uh, who were in captivity and telling them about what was going to take place when they returned from captivity. Let, let, me, let me, if I can do it like this, for the last 15 or so chapters in Ezekiel's prophetic book, what we see is he begins to describe the new city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem um, had been destroyed uh, as the people had been taken into captivity. There were a few remnant of people who wanted to argue and fight and fight back against the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians said, we'll take this in our own hands. And they destroyed the temple and they destroyed the city. And that's why in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, we realized that when they came back from captivity, they had to rebuild the walls of the city and rebuild the temple because they were destroyed by the Babylonians. But what Ezekiel is talking about is what's about to happen. And he's not talking about in a generic sense. He's talking about what specifically is going to happen with God's people. The last thing I want to point out before we hit the text for today is to remember this. Every prophetic book of the Bible, every all the Old Testament prophets, their prophetic ministry unfolds in three dimensions. First of all, it unfolds in time. In other words, he has a, they have a message for the people of Israel. The second one is that it will unfold in, in, in due time, I like to call it. In other words, their prophetic ministry reaches out to talk about the coming of Jesus. And finally, the prophetic ministry then reaches out and reaches out into the future so that we'll know that the prophetic ministry will manifest in end times when we are in the presence of the Lord. And so if we keep that in mind, the prophetic books, they may be Old Testament, but they're not old. They're relevant to us today because the promises that God made to his people are the same promises that he makes to his people today. And as a result, what we must embrace is these promises uh, of God's, in this case, uh, in, in, in our last case, in, in terms of God's um, 
provision and now in terms of God's presence is for us. It's not for just Israel. It's for us, all of those who are God's chosen. And remember, just as surely as Israel was chosen, Ephesians lets us know, First Peter lets us know that we are God's chosen and elect as well. So here in chapter 48, that's where we are located today, um, uh, Ezekiel began to talk about the division of the land when the people returned from captivity. That's what he was talking about. He was letting them know that the same way that God had given uh, Moses and Joshua instruction about how the land would be divided when they entered into the land, now Ezekiel is giving that same instruction about how the land would be divided once they re-entered the land. Now, remember, Israel's basis point for their prosperity was the land, that the land that God had given them was theirs, and that it bore all of the fruit, all of the, the sustenance that he needed from the land, God had made that promise that he would give it. And so knowing that, he talks about the land as if it's already there, but that's what prophetic ministry does. It speaks it uh, as it is because it's going to come to pass. And so as he, he, he gives, and I won't go through all of the details of the early verses, chapter 48, he goes through about uh, 30 or so verses where he discusses, um, how the land will be divided and what the priest's work will be and, and what the offerings will look like and what the borders will look like and what the priests will do and, and how the suburbs will develop and, and, and how long it will take before the land begins to be replenished as God had planned for it to be. But in verse 30, he begins now to talk about the name of the city. And, again, he's talking about Judah. And I know I want to hold on about three more minutes because we're going to see how this applies to us. He said, verse 30, he said, And these are the goings out of the city on the north side, 4,500 measures, and the gates of the city shall be after the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, three gates north, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east side, 4,500 and three gates, and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan. I'm giving you that background because what he was effectively saying was the, the city of Jeru, uh, Jerusalem at this time uh, was about 34 square miles. That was, that was just the city. But that was a 34-mile square uh, city. And so he talks about that. He talks about verse 33, um, how uh, the distance and, and, and which direction it will go and how far, how long, and how wide. But in verse 35 is where we're going to hold on out today. He said it was around about 18,000 measures. But here's what he said. He said, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. Now, why was that important? Well, first of all, because he was talking to people who were returning from captivity. What they missed more than anything else while in captivity was the very fellowship with God. God always wants to fellowship with his people. That's what he wants. He initiated when the people came out of the bondage of Egypt. He maintained it throughout the wilderness. He, he restored it when they got into the land. He kept it until the people were so disobedient that they had to be cast out of the land that God had given them. But what Ezekiel wanted them to know and what he wants us to know is that at all times God wants to be in our presence. He wants us to enjoy his presence. He wants us to experience his, his presence and all that comes with it. What comes with it? Well, first of all, if you look at verse verse 35 again, when he pauses there at the very end, the last four words, he says, the Lord. And I'm going to stop there. He says, the Lord, who? The only true God, the God who is faithful to his promises, the God who is rich in mercy, the God who is glorious in his majesty, the God who is righteous in his judgment, the God who is wise and holy in his counsel toward his people, the God in whose presence we are happy and in whose absence we are sad. He's saying, the Lord, I want, he said, I want the people who are returning from this captivity to understand that what they have missed for so long is what they're about to receive when they come back into the city. Their hearts have been heavy. Uh, they were forced to sing strange songs in a strange land. But God says, now I'm bringing you back. And I want us to understand that some, for us today, um, captivity is not so much about space and time. It's about spirit and emotion. Sometimes what we're going through in life can cause us to be disconnected and feel um in exile because of what's going on around us. It may not, we may be in a nice place and may be going, um, driving a nice car and have everything else we need, but we can feel isolated because of what we're going through, situations, circumstances. These things can cause us to feel isolated. It can cause us to feel dispossessed and disconnected. It can cause us to feel low and, and be heavy laden with all this taking place. And what Ezekiel is telling us today is to understand that as we are in this this relationship with God. Let me pause here. But Israel's relationship was, was, was demonstrated by the land. For us, relationship, I mean, I'm sorry, for us, God's presence is demonstrated by our relationship with him. The land for Israel, our relationship here with God through Jesus Christ today in 2020. And so as, as Ezekiel tells Israel, hey, the Lord is there, he wants us to understand today that the Lord is with us. 
Now, you would think that Israel would have to have been told that because they knew that God was a great God who dwelt everywhere. But they were so disoriented by their exile that many of them were walking back and will be coming back. And we find out later that they actually came back with, with fear, with doubt, with frustration, even if they came back to the land that God had given, given them. And that's what we must be aware of today. Fear, doubt, frustration, which are all attached to the enemy that sends our way, can cause us to feel as if God is not there, that God is not with us, that we're by ourselves, that nobody is, is upholding us, nobody's there to deliver us, nobody's there to give us joy, nobody's there to make good on their promises. And all Ezekiel is reminding us is that the Lord, who did it for Israel, who will do it for us today, that the Lord is there. His presence is never separated from us today because we have a deposit of God's presence in us. We may be so disoriented that we can't feel it, but what what Ezekiel is saying, to let us know it's there so that we can then pursue God in such a way that we can feel what he has for us. Um, one of the things that one of my pet peeves with my kids, if I say, go get such and such for me, and, and they and I, go, go out, go get the cranberry juice. Where is it, Dad? It's in, the, it's in the refrigerator. And they'll walk in there, and they'll look in the refrigerator and say, I don't see it. And uh, they'll come back out there, boy, whichever one it is. Boy, it's in the refrigerator. They go in there for a split second, and they come right back. Daddy, it's not there. So, of course, I get out of bed, oh, off the sofa, wherever I am, and I say, you know, I moved the milk, and I might move a little orange juice. I said, there's the cranberry juice. But what happened was it was there, but in their either short attention span or hurry to do something else, or maybe they were just tired, they didn't pursue. They didn't do what it took to get to the cranberry juice. And many of us are doing that in a spiritual sense today. Many of us in our lives are so caught up with what's taking place that we don't take time to seek God. As Ezekiel said, who is there? Who is with us? We Go to bed at night. Some of us talk to turn all night. And I, I'm guilty of that myself. We've done that. We're so busy being going about our business, we forget that God is, in fact, there. Our circumstances, we are, are burned down by life issues. And as a result, we forget to take time to seek him who is where. He is already there. And so what Ezekiel is trying to get all of us to understand as believers is that God is never far from us. We may drift off from God, but here's the beauty. Even as we drift, God's presence, we know that he's omnipotent, omniscient. And I'm the present, which means that we cannot actually leave his presence. And as children of God, we can't be disconnected from him even if we try. But what we must understand is we're missing out on the experience of his presence because we don't take the time or take the effort to seek him in everything. This is why, and I've said this before, why our own individual devotion is important. The individual devotion is important because it allows us to be to free ourselves from all of the the, the distractions of the world, and allows us to focus on him who is all that we need. Um, devotion is sometimes cutting off the TV and cutting off everything else and just saying, I'm going to spend five or 10 or 15 minutes with the Lord. Now, let me give you a practical application for that. Some of us say, well, if you can't give an hour, don't give nothing. Now, we don't say it, but that's how we feel. But I want you to understand that God, because he is here, we don't have to search for him high and low. If we just take five minutes and say, Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for this day, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I need your direction. I need your guidance. That's what we can experience when we recognize that God is already there. God can't move. He can't leave. If he leaves, he's still coming as he's leaving. Uh, I heard some preachers say a long time ago that God's presence is so great that even if he leaves, he meets himself going even as he's coming. So we can't get out of his presence. But we must take the time to experience him by seeking him. What, Eze what Ezekiel was trying to say and what he's trying to tell us today is, Children of God understand the great presence of God. Children of God understand the the the, the non negotiable, non negatable presence of God is always with us. And in this presence of God, what we can find, let me just give a little little grocery list if you don't mind, of things we can find. When we take the time to 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 talk to God, who is here? When we take time to fellowship with God, to commune with God, who is here, what we'll find is we get to experience the great favor and the presence of God in our lives. Let me, let me put it another way. I've, I've talked about the dinner table. Um, it's nothing like going to a great restaurant and having a great dinner, but it's also nothing better than having great company when you at that great dinner. And so as, as children of God, we may, we may have things, but there's nothing better than having things while we're having a relationship and a joyful communion with God. That's what God wants us to seek. He wants us to seek this joyful 
communing with him. And in doing so, we experience, first of all, his favor. Now, we know what that is. That is his, his, uh, his grace. That is, that is what we don't deserve, but he gives us anyway. In seeking God, we find ourselves in a unique place where we can feel, experience, and know that God is blessing us. One of the great tragedies of being a Christian is not recognizing that God blesses us even in the midst of our trials and tribulations. That sometimes when things are going difficult, we feel like, well, I'm not getting blessed. I've heard people say that. And one of the things that I remember when I was, um, I don't know if I ever tell you that story. I got one story tonight. Just want to give me one. Um, when I was um, being vetted for the, part, uh, the transplant process, there was a, um, the chaplain had brought me, the defense chaplain talked to me and, and interviewed me to see if I was a good candidate. And as we began to talk, she began actually to share with me some of her issues. And she said, sir, I don't know about you, but if I were you, I just don't know if I'd do this. And I was kind of shocked. So I was like, is that on the list that you read off of? And what happened was, even as she described to me all that was going to happen and all that I had to do, she got discouraged. So I patted her on the hand. I said, listen. However God wants us to work out, it's going to work out. I said, so I'm going to trust him all the way. And she hugged me because I don't know what happened, but maybe she had had a bad day. But my point in saying this is not bragging on what I did. It's just the fact that when you realize the presence of God, you feel his grace even in the midst of your circumstance. And that's what we have to have. The more we seek God, the more we are aware of his perpetual grace, that we see that he is there even when we're going through. We see that he is there even when we when, when trials are coming. There's a storm. We still know he's there, and we, and we are trusting in that. And as a result of that, we feel his presence. In other words, grace is opens the door to experience God's presence. His grace us is in his presence. When we're having worship at church, it is the grace of God allows us to be in his presence. And, and doing so, we find ourselves Holy Spirit filled, or lifting our hands, saying, thank you, Lord. And guess what? It doesn't have to happen just in the church. We learn this now half of these times. We learn that at, when you can be at your house, in your car, in your office, and you can feel the presence of the Lord and say, thank you, because you have sought him because he is where? Somebody tell me, where is he? He is, he is here. Next thing we understand, I, I got I got it. There's two more points. Let me see what time I got. I got a few minutes. Y'all give me just about four more minutes. The second thing is when we recognize that God is here, Ezekiel was speaking to people who had been taken captive. They were in Judah, Judah and Jerusalem, and they were snatched away. Who got them? The Babylonians. The Babylonians came with a big army. They came and they took over Jerusalem and they took people. They displaced people. And so one of the in, 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 inherent fears in the people of God was that they could be dis- displaced and taken away. Now, let me park that for a second and go back. One of the things we see during the time of Israel's strength was that they never actually won a battle by their military capacity, but they always won their battles by who? By the power of God. David, Joshua, all these people can testify that God fights the battles. How many times have we said the battle's not yours, it's whose? It's the Lord. And so in understanding that, when he said that the Lord is here, he wanted them to understand that not only would they get to experience the presence and the great grace and presence of God, but he wanted them also to understand because of God's presence, enemies will be repelled simply by the presence of God. He wanted to remind them because some of them didn't know. Some of them grew up in, and, and, and Ezekiel was one of them. Ezekiel had grown up when Israel was constantly under attack. And as a result, he needed to know and he needed to share with others his contemporaries, hey, when, when we're there in the presence of the Lord, when we're in Jerusalem and he's there, guess what? Enemies won't bother us. You remember, um, in, 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 it, it, it happened in Second Kings, it happened in First Kings, it happened in First and Second Chronicles. Time and time again, the enemies of God surrounded Jerusalem. And whenever God spoke, you remember a couple of times they fought each other, and sometimes they fought each other, they killed each other, and the people of Israel just picked up. Matter of fact, we can go all the way back to Gideon. Gideon uh, experienced the presence of the Lord. He had 300 troops. He beat a whole nation. Why? Because of the presence of God. The presence of God repels enemies. And the same thing is true today. When how many of us have had folk who tried to get us and God elevated us anyway? Anybody out there to say that? You, you, that you that, 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 that somebody was out to get you, and the next thing you know, God has turned up your them into a stepping stone the way He wants you to be. And so this is what we must understand. We know that God presence of God. We can te- we can testify that God will repel enemies. And sometimes I said we we it, it's not just a person. Sometimes it's the enemy himself trying to break us, and he uses people to do it because, remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the reality is that this, this text lets us know that there's no reason for us to fear folk 
Why? Because if we recognize that the Lord is here, enemies will have to find somewhere else to go. They just got to go somewhere else. They can't live in our neighborhood. They can't live in our house. They got to go somewhere else because the Lord is here. The Lord is here is a repellent. I like it. A repellent to the enemy attack. Let me, let me do, I do two more. Not only will God repel enemies, but he'll also protect us when we realize he is here. There are too many of us have jumped the gun. And we have done something that wasn't authorized and approved by God for us to do because we thought we had to take care of ourselves. When we realize that the presence of God is with us, that he is here with us, wherever you are, with Nat County, let me see, I see a couple of streets off of Cascade, I see some folk off of, let me see, down in Cobb County. I see some folk, uh, let me look around here, I see some folk all over this old town. Guess what? God is there. And, and, and he's with you. And because of that, he will protect you. That means he will take care of you. Protection is not just about repelling enemies, but it's also about being strengthened. It's about feeling the comfort of God. It's about feeling um, his, his, his comfort that, that gives you the sense of security. That's what protection is about. So protection, people get, people get um, um, what do you call these, um, um, when you put the button, push the button in, um, security system. You get security systems where you know that you got somebody, that, that, that somebody breaks in the house, alarm go off. That's why we got security systems. What we got to understand, we got security systems. It's never going to be offline. Power outages won't affect it. And no, it never is going to ring and somebody sleep on the other end. Who? We have the presence of God and He will protect us and we have security in His protection. We can sleep knowing that God's going to take care of us. We can rest knowing that God is going to make moves on our behalf. We can, we can, we can take comfort. Even in what we're facing as a people and as a nation today, we can take comfort in this one reality, that whatever happens, however things turn out, that the sovereign power of God will take care of us. Remember, remember you got the world economy and you got God's economy. We're a part of God's economy, which means that he can prosper us. We, we learned this. We, were, we remember we learned this back in First Kings. God will prosper us as we follow him, even in the midst of trial and tribulation. There are testimonies all around now. The last four years, I remember when we first got this president, people said, I don't know if I'm going to make it. But guess what? Both prosper. Some folk prophet as they trusted God. Some folk panicked because they didn't realize God was there. But when you realize God is here, you don't have to make a move because you know that you got full coverage and protection by the Lord. I'm going to do two more things. Finally, we understand, well, next to finally, we recognize that not only will God uh, give us his favor and presence when we realize he is here, and not only we understand that God will repel our enemies and God protect us, but we also understand that God will bring all, I want to listen to this, all good to his people, as we recognize that he is here and we commune with him because he's here. Ezekiel was trying to establish communion with God. He was trying to establish the people to be reconnected with God, and he wanted them to know, listen, he's there. You ain't got to try to wonder where he is. He's there. He's going to be there. When we get back, he's going to be there. He's telling us he's here. He's here with us right now. And so as we establish communion with him, he wants us to know that God will bring good to us. Let me, let me talk about this for a moment. <laughs> Paul, I think, put it like this. He said, we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So as we love the Lord and as we recognize we are the called, if we put that on the right-hand side, understand that God can take the most miserable, challenging things, and he can work them for our good. The challenge is, is, is that we recognize it. The challenge is that we see it. In other words, I was having a conversation with a friend today about, they were saying, well, I just can't do nothing else. I'm just so frustrated, so stressed out. I don't know if I can do this right here. I said, hold on. The day is the day you need to do it. I said, because God can use our weakness to make us strong, but God can use his weakness to make somebody else strong. And that's what we must understand. God works things together for good. I believe if all of us took a minute or two and looked back over our lives, we would find out there were times that things looked awful. But out of that awfulness, God brought good. There were some times when we were in, in, in dire straits and we were about to pull our hair out for those of us who have hair. But, 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 but God in that moment, guess what he did? He brought some good out of it. There were times when love, I got back against the wall and we were just tired of talking to folks and didn't want to be bothered with folks. But guess what happened? God turned it around, and worked it for our good. That's what he means that when he wanted them to understand. You remember when, when in, in, in Nehemiah, when they were building those temple walls and, and, and all of the enemies came and said, hey, we want to help you in Israel, and are we good? And then he said, well, if you ain't going to help us, we're going to go back and tell the king that you're out of order and we're going to destroy this, this city. And they got afraid, and Nehemiah said, hold on, you know, God's with us. And the Bible said they had a willingness to work. They realized, that's when they said, that's our believers. They felt the presence of God, and as a result, they didn't quit. They kept pressing, and guess what? The work was done. This is what we got to embrace. 
that work for us to do. As we understand our purpose in the Lord, as we understand that God is present with us, what we'll find out is as we press, we will experience, we will experience that God will take the challenging moments. It may take a while, but it's going to happen, that he will turn those challenging moments into blessings for us, but also blessings for others. Last point, not only will God do these things, we realize his presence, but most over, overarching is what God is capable of doing. Is he, he will lead us and guide us. He wanted Israel to know, listen, when you get back, we ain't, we, 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 we got to come back because we didn't allow God to lead us and govern us. He said, but when we get back, God is going to be there and he's going to lead us and guide us. Here's what God's telling us today. In order to avoid pitfalls, in order to avoid the snares, let us recognize that God is here so that then we can submit ourselves so that he can lead and guide us. He can govern us. He can direct us. One of the biggest things, and I remember when I was first started passing, I guess I can tell you this story now, it's been 17 years. When I first started passing, I, at St. Peter, um, I wanted to figure everything out and handle stuff myself. And I, can I tell y'all now, I made the biggest mistake then. So if y'all can remember the mistake I made, you know why I made it? Because I was working out of my head. But it wasn't until I submitted myself to God's guidance and leadership that he began to lead me on a path that was beneficial, not just for me, but for us as a congregation of believers. And so that's why when we ask, well, what are we going to do, Pastor? Well, let me, God got to tell us what to do. Because if, I, if, if it was up to me, you know, it, it would go awry. But God does that. And God does it in our individual lives. He is, he is willing and he is desirous of us to submit to his authority so what he has for us will be manifest. In our lives. That's what God wants. See, God has a plan for all of us. I mean, if, if it was a supercomputer, it would hold the kind of information God has for what he wants for his people. And he wants us to submit to him so that he can give us what he wants. So that in knowing that we can walk in his authority, even if he don't give you the whole plan, he gives you the step to take. And when you get the step to take, you can walk in his authority. And guess what? When you're walking in God's promise because he's there, in his authority because he's there, you will have manifest what he has for you, and he'll be there. I'll stop tonight. But I want us to understand that more than anything else, every now and then, when you feel isolated, say, the Lord is here. When you feel alone, say, the Lord is here. When you're facing trouble, say, the Lord is here. And recognize that because of these things, we get to experience the power of the only true God who is faithful to his promises, who is rich in mercy and glory and majesty, and who is and will ever be, will be and who is wise in counsel and by whose, in whose presence we have joy. Recognize that. And in doing so, we can repel. The enemy will be repelled. We will experience the victory. God will work things out. And finally, he will lead and guide us into that place in this world of joy, but most of all, the place in his eternity where there will be love without any sorrow and joy without a tear. I'll call a time out on y'all tonight, and I'll see y'all tomorrow night. I thank God for you, and I pray that God will continue to bless us as we continue to study his word. We got two things we worked on. We know that the Lord is our provider. We saw it crystal clearly, and now we know the Lord is here. We experience his presence. Don't have to find him because he's already where? He's already here. Let us pray. Father God, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we come tonight to say thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that you have made available to us through Jesus Christ. We pray, God, that now we would download these words that the Lord is here into our hearts, that we may be able to walk a different walk. Let your word get in our ears so we can hear it all the time. When trouble comes, that we can hear it. Let your word get in our feet that we can walk in it. Let your word get in our hearts that we will be spiritually strengthened because of it. Let your word get in our minds so that's what we think about. And then let your word get in our mouths, our lips, our tongues, our Vocal course so that we can declare it to the world that the Lord is with us, that we can declare it to each other. Don't you forget, brother, the Lord is with us. And finally, we can declare it to ourselves, just like David did his declaring and encourage ourselves in the Lord. I pray that every household is blessed that took a moment to tune in tonight, that there will be peace and joy in that home. And I pray, God, that every family will be blessed. And then, God, I pray a special prayer for each individual who has been so consistent and faithful in their, in their efforts to be a part of this expectation moment, Lord, that you ordained almost 200 days ago. We say thank you, Lord. And it is now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Hold on. Thank you, thank you. Amen. 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 Amen.